What's up guys, it's Sean here. Now recently Google released TensorFlow 2.0 which is the next major update to their deep learning library. Now I'm really excited to show you this update because it's a lot simpler than the original TensorFlow, which required using things like sessions and placeholders. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, then you're already well in your way to mastering TensorFlow 2.0. So in this video, I'm gonna show you the basic building blocks of TensorFlow 2.0. And then I'm going to show you how to create your own custom neural network to classify images of handwritten digits. Now, the first awesome thing about TensorFlow is that it's super easy to use from right within your browser without having to install anything, except perhaps the browser itself. So let's search up Google Colab and click on this link. And then after signing in, you just create a new Python 3 notebook and install TensorFlow 2.0 by going to tensorflow.org clicking on the install tab and then running this line. We can then import NumPy and of course TensorFlow and printing the version just to make sure. Now, in case you're not familiar with what TensorFlow actually does, it essentially allows us to approximate functions with these special things called variables, which essentially transform the inputs to the outputs. And the idea is that we know the output that the function should give for the corresponding input, but we don't know the values of the internal function parameters that will transform the input to that output. So then TensorFlow has some built-in optimizers that use a technique called gradient descent to tweak those variables for us to get the calculated output closer to the expected output. Now for this particular dataset, it's clear that the true value of m is one, but scaling to larger neural networks with millions of parameters makes this tool hella convenient. So the most basic building block in TensorFlow is the variable, which we can create with tf.variable and printing it tells us that it's a TensorFlow variable with a name, a shape property, a data type, and an actual value which we can access by calling .numpy on it. We can then define a function that uses this variable to calculate the output from the input. So let's print out the output of f of five and we see that it is of type tensor. Now, all this means is that this output depends on a TensorFlow variable that was involved in one of the mathematical operations along the way. And this allows TensorFlow to track how much an output changes with respect to a change in each variable. So then to be able to train our function variables to fit the data, we need to define a loss function to minimize. And since we want our output of f of five to be five, we would like to minimize the absolute difference between the two values. Now we also need an optimizer to actually do the minimizing. So we can define one from tf.optimizers and select the atom optimizer and also set a value for the learning rate to be one just for illustration. Then we can just call the minimize function on the optimizer passing in the loss to be minimized and the list of variables that it should tweak to achieve that. And one important note about TensorFlow 2.0 the loss needs to actually be a function with no arguments that returns the tensor to be minimized. So we can easily fix this by turning this into an anonymous lambda function. And running this, we see that the value of a has been decreased by one, i.e. the learning rate. And f of five is a bit closer to five than before. So then after running this a few times, the value of a decreases and oscillates towards the value of one, which is what we expected it should be. So that's how TensorFlow operates. Now I'm gonna show you the high level interface for training a neural network to classify handwritten digits. So let's start by going to TensorFlow's tutorial page where they have a beginner's tutorial for downloading the dataset and creating the model. And we can access the MNIST dataset from the tf.keras.datasets.mnist module and download the train and test sets by calling the load data function. And let's print the shape of each of these to get an idea of the dimensions. So it looks like we have 60,000 samples to train on and 10,000 samples to test our model. And it's also helpful to print the first sample so we can see that it's a 2D array of numbers, which is probably the pixel darkness of the image. And then we can use matplotlib to display it as an image of the number five. Then the next line here is normalizing the image pixel values to be between zero and one for stability of the model. Now here we are actually defining the network with layers which the input data will pass through to be transformed to an output of 10 probabilities, one for the input being classified as each of the 10 digits. I'll just get rid of this dropout layer to keep things simple. So now that we have our network architecture, this line here links up the output with the loss function and the optimizer and also allows us to specify what performance metrics it should print out during training. 
then this line actually runs the training on the data for a number of complete runs over the datasets, which we call epochs. I'll also just set a batch size for how many samples to train on at one time. So then after that's done, the final line evaluates the accuracy of the trained model on the unseen test dataset. And we can make predictions by calling the model on an input sample, and this outputs probabilities for the input being of each class, so we can look for the class with the maximum probability. So that's pretty much it for the high level API for defining, training and testing our neural network in like what, five lines of code? but I still don't know what the heck I just did or how on earth I'm going to customize this for other datasets. And so I started scrolling down a little bit and I saw this bit of code for defining your own model class, which was okay, but then you scroll down a little bit more to the optimizer and then I'm like, what the, what is this day gradient tape thing? And I was even more confused. So I set out to reverse engineer this network from the ground up. And after finally figuring it out, here's how I did it. Now the documentation will be your best friend when you're writing your own custom model. So let's check that out for the tf.keras.model class by going to the menu, then to API and then click on R2.0. And here it shows you all the modules. So look for Keras and here we can find the model class. So let's click on that. So then skimming through a bit, past the aliases, blah, blah, blah. Oh, this looks like something useful. And it seems like the layers are initialized as properties in the constructor. And then this call function takes the inputs and runs them through each layer and returns the final output. Now this sounds promising. So let's use this as our custom model and replace the layers with those from our initial model. Now the next thing is to set up a loss function. So if we go back to our API, we come across a tf.losses over here, which seems relevant, so let's actually check out the overview. So here it tells us about a bunch of classes that calculate different types of losses between the predictions and labels. And it also has sparse cross-entropy loss, which seems familiar. So clicking on that, it says to use this, we just create an instance of the class, and then we can call that instance by passing in the expected values and also the predicted probabilities and it returns a single loss value. So we can then create the instance of this loss as a property in our model and then define a function that given the inputs and expected outputs will calculate the loss between the expected and the predicted values. And now that we have our loss function, we need an optimizer to minimize it. So now if we check out the tf.optimizers modules page, we can see what parameters the atom optimizer takes in and then just create an instance of it in our model with just the default settings. Now let's have a look at the minimize function, which takes in a loss function to minimize and the list of variables to optimize. So then let's create a function optimize that takes in the inputs and expected outputs. Then we'll create a lambda function that calculates the loss given the inputs and the outputs. And then we'll call the minimize function on the optimizer passing in that loss function. And for the var list, the keras.model class has a trainable weights property that gives us the weights in each layer. Now we're almost there, we just need a function to run the training. So then let's create this function and call it fit and have it take in the x, y data, the batch size and the number of epochs. And then for each epoch, we will loop through each batch in the full dataset and call the optimize function on that data. And let's also print out the loss and the accuracy after each epoch like the original model did. So we can just call the loss function with the data for our loss but for the accuracy, we will need something else. So going back to our trusty documentation, I found this module called metrics, which has a class called accuracy and all it does is just counts the proportion of matching indices in two lists. So we can save an instance of this and then create a function for calculating the accuracy by calling the accuracy instance, passing in the expected classes and also the predictions. But since the predictions are actually probabilities, we need to use the argmax function to get the highest probabilities index. So then we can just calculate our accuracy as such and print a bunch of stuff. Now, this is the moment of truth where we will initialize our model and call the training function. And it looks like we managed to build our own neural network from the bottom up using TensorFlow 2.0. Now, I know it can sometimes be a bit difficult to get used to the new version, 
and from my experience having worked with the previous version of TensorFlow definitely helped me out with that. So that's why I created this tutorial as a starting point for beginners to learn to apply TensorFlow to their own projects without having to go through tons of documentation and those incredibly fun runtime errors. No! So if you found this video helpful, please do share it with your fellow deep learning enthusiasts and also let me know in the comments of any other deep learning libraries or algorithms that you would like a tutorial for. I actually have a bunch of deep learning project tutorials in TensorFlow coming up for you guys. So make sure to hit that button, ring that bell, pull that finger, whatever YouTube's doing these days. Anyways, thanks so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoy TensorFlow 2.0. And until next time, keep learning like a machine. Bye.